to all the moms. Moms of children who are still at home or all grown up. Moms who've outlived a son or daughter. Or moms of babies they never got to hold. Moms who've raised kids all on their own or became a mom to someone who needed one. Moms of children who have wandered from God or the longing to be moms who are still waiting. God perfectly arranged each of you into the role you have today. His word recognizes you as capable, strong, and praiseworthy. Everything you do makes our lives more beautiful. Happy Mother's Day. Today I have a special message that I believe God's put on my heart specifically for this season that we're in, but um, specifically for Mother's Day. And uh, today the title for the, the message is The Faith of a Mother, The Faith of a Mother. And um, a mother's faith is vitally important because it shapes generations after her. It has a ripple effect that affects a family tree, and, and, and it shapes um, her, her kids and her kids' kids, and it, it goes beyond just her lifespan. In fact, we see this in Scripture. Paul, the greatest apostle, he even mentions this to his letters to Timothy. In 2 Timothy verse, uh, or chapter 1, verse 5, it says, I remember your genuine faith. Look at this. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice. And I know that the same faith, the same faith continues strong in you. This is why, most of us know this verse, this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. It was still Timothy's job to fan into flames the gifts of God and to build his faith, yes. However, he was able to do that. He was able to stand on something because of the, the foundation of the godly women before him, the foundation that they laid. He was then able to build off of that. What does he say? The same faith that was in your grandmother, the same faith that is, was in your mother, I see in you. And now build on that foundation. I want to stop here for a second before I continue in my message. And I want to give honor where, where honor is due. And I want to honor my mom, uh, Helen, who's here on the front row. And I want to honor you because this verse stands true for our family. And if not for your faith, not a perfect faith, but a hungry faith for God and for his word and for prayer, if not for your faith, who knows where our family would be? But I do know that a by church would not exist if not for your faith and the faith of pursuing God even through some of the most difficult seasons of your life. And so I want to say that I love you, and I'm thankful for you, and I honor you uh, today. Could we give it up for my mom, Helen DeBell? The faith of a mother is vitally important because even according to Scripture, it can shape family trees. And so it's a great reminder for the burden that even us as parents, dads and moms uh, together, the burden that we carry is that my decisions don't just affect me. Whenever I choose to, to serve God, it affects my kids and generations after me. When I choose not to serve God, it affects my kids and generations after me. What I do in this life, it never just affects me. And so the faith of a mother is vitally important. So I'm going to look at today three lessons that we can learn from a mother's faith. And we're going to read it from 2 Kings chapter 4. So if you brought your Bible, you can go to 2 Kings chapter 4 and follow along with me there. I'll have it on the screen for you. 2 Kings chapter 4. The first lesson that we can learn, though, from this story that we're going to read is this. A mother's faith is active. A mother's faith is active, and we can learn from an active faith. We can see it, and we can learn from it, and we can apply it to our lives. A mother's faith is active. I'm going to give you a second here to fill in the blank, uh, especially for all the kiddos in the room, uh, so they're not missing it. A mother's faith is active. We're going to be re begin reading in 2 Kings 4 and, and beginning in verse 8. And this is a story from the life of Elisha. And it's the story of Elisha and 
the Shunammite woman. And so let me read it here. Second Kings 4, verse 8. It says, One day Elisha went to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. She said to her husband, I am sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Look at this, verse 10. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. Uh, this woman was concerned for the well-being of the man of God. She saw a need and she said, I, I, we need to do something for this man. Something in her prompted her to say, let's do something, let's go out of her way. And she was willing to inconvenience herself and her family and her finances and her time and, and her husband's time to, to furnish, to build, and to serve this man of God. She was willing to inconvenience herself in service to others. This principle is all through Scripture, and it's what we see even in the New Testament that applies and is a commandment for us to, to follow as well. We see it in the book of James. James 2, verse 14, he, he talks about this exact same principle. James 2, 14 says this, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Here's what he's saying. It can't. If I say I'm a Christian, but I don't, if I say I'm a Christian, but I'm not Christ-like outside of Sundays at church, he said that faith, it, it can't save anyone. That's worthless. It's just lip service. Let's continue on. Um, verse 15, suppose you see a brother or a sister who has no food or clothing. And you say goodbye and, and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? <laughs> so you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and it's useless. That's what Jesus said, right? You're going to know a, a, a tree by its fruit. How are you going to know if the root of a tree, if the root of the heart of a person is true, is good, is rooted in righteousness, it'll be produced in their life. It's actions. This same principle is what we see in the Shudamite woman. What does she say? Let's, let's, let's give this guy some cover. Let's give him some food. He's in need. He's traveling. She was doing this principle long before James ever wrote it to, to us for the New Testament. But this woman's faith, what was it? It was active. And because it was active, it produced good deeds. Again, our good deeds are not what saves us. However, because we have been saved, and as I walk more closely with Jesus and I try to m m put my life in agreement with his and, and, and mimic the things that he does, I can't help but do good deeds. My good deeds aren't what saves me. My faith by grace, by grace through faith is what saves me. However, as I walk with Jesus, I can't help but serve. I can't help but help. And that's, that's what we're seeing here is that her faith was active because it was active. It produced good deeds, which ultimately led to the blessing of God. Let me show you. It ultimately led to the blessing of God. Elisha, he asked the woman, he says, hey, can I put in a good word? I mean, you're so kind to me. Can I put in a good word for you with the king? Can I put in a good word uh, for you with the, with the, with the military? Uh, what, what can I do to help you? And she says, no, I'm good. She declines his offer for help and for blessing initially, and she says, I'm good. I don't need anything. My family takes care of me. However, look at verse 14 here, 2 Kings 4, verse 14. Later, Elisha asked Gehazi, which was his servant, he says, what can we do for her? Gehazi replied, well, she doesn't have a son, and her husband is an old man. Stop here for a second. You got to find some humor uh, in the Bible because uh, he doesn't say she's old, Right? <laughs> You don't say that to a woman, right? Her husband's old, man. That guy, she's, yeah, yeah she's young, but he's old. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, uh, you can see humor all through the Bible. The husband's an old man. <laughs> but verse 15, call her back again, Elisha told him. When the woman returned, Elisha said to her, as she stood in the doorway, next year, at this time, you will be holding a son in your arms. But look at her response. No, my Lord, she cried. Oh, man of God, don't deceive me and get my hopes up like that. Verse 17, but sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant. And at that time, the following year, she had a son, just as Elisha had said. This is a relatable verbiage here, a relatable response, I would say, that she gives to the man of God. Don't get my hopes up like that. Why? She had her hopes up many times before. 
and now she's well advanced in years. And she had her hopes up. But time after time, she was disappointed and let down and disappointed and let down. And she was finally to a point where she didn't ask the man of God for that. But he says, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to move on God's behalf to give you this blessing. She had her hopes up many times before, but here's what's interesting. God rewards her active faith. If she does not serve the man of God, she doesn't get this blessing. If she does not go out of her way to take care, to serve, to feed, to go above and beyond and make a special room for him, guess what? They don't have this interaction. There's no doorway for her to stand in to receive this from the man of God. Her active faith opened the door for the blessing of God to come in. God rewarded her servant's heart, her active faith, with her heart's desire. And so here's a good reflection question for us when it comes to learning these lessons in faith from a mother. Am I positioning myself for God's blessing by having an active faith? Is my faith active? Is your faith active? And I'm not just saying in the sense of that you're doing a lot of things to say, look at how much I'm doing. I'm saying if somebody watched your life this past week, without you knowing it, could they look and say, that person is Christ-like? Or could they look at your life from this past week and then you say, yeah, I'm a Christian, and then be blown away because they'd be like, I would have never known. I would have never known. My oldest brother, Ben, um, for a while he was living in a different state and, and uh, he said, you know, as he was growing in his walk with God and reading his Bible and different, different things like that, he said, I came to a point, he said, this was kind of his awakening moment where he chose to, to really get, go all in with his faith. He said, I got to a moment or a point in my life where I realized that point right there, that if anyone, uh, if I told my friends that I was a Christian, if I told the, my coworkers that I was a Christian, that they would be surprised. And he said, that's when I knew I had to make some changes. And I think that's a really good, uh, a really good reflection question on, am I producing fruit in my life? Again, not for my salvation, but because of my salvation. I get to represent Jesus now. It's not a burden. <laughs> I get to serve other people. Why? He's done so much for me. How, how, can I, how can I help myself but help other people if it's in my capacity to do so? So the first lesson is an act of faith. The second lesson is this. A mother's faith speaks in faith. Lesson number two or point number two is this. A mother's faith speaks in faith. This is where this story gets really interesting. A godly mother knows how to guard her mouth and speak faith in times of need. A, a godly mother knows how to guard her mouth and speak faith in times of need. So look at 2 Kings. Let's continue our story. Verse 17 now. It says, But the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come, of which Elisha had told her. And the child grew. Now it happened one day when he went out to his father, to the reapers. He was out in the field. Verse 19, and he said to his father, my head, my head. So he said to the servant, carry him to his mother. Uh, again, you can find a lot of humor in the Bible, right? Like this kid's just complaining, just take him to his mom, okay? Let his mom deal with it, right? We're, we're doing some man's work out here in the field, right? Take him to his mom. Uh, take him to his mother. Verse 20, when he had taken him and he brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. Verse 21, and she went up and she laid him on the bed of the man of God. She shut the door upon him and she went out. Verse 22. Then she called to her husband and said, Please send me one of the young men, one of the servants, and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. So the dad said, her husband said, Why are you going to him today? It is neither the, the new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said, It is well. I don't know about you, <laughs> but if I, had to, if I was in her position, I, I would go to my spouse and say, we got to go. Put your tools down. We're done working for the day. We got to go get the man of God together. It's, it's, if anyone's at a, you know, justified in panicking, freaking out, uh, um, beside themselves, right? It's this woman. What does she say? Hey, why are you going? Why are you traveling today? Why are you going to take one of our servants and one of the donkeys? Why are you going? It's well. It is well. Imagine the pain in her heart. She just held her son, who was a miracle child. 
he, her son in her arms as he died, yet she guarded her mouth. It is well. So here's what happens. Her and one of the servants, they ride as fast as possible to Elisha, the man of God. Verse 25 says this, so it was when the man of God saw her afar off that he said to his servant Gehazi, look, the Shunammite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, look at this verbiage, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, it is well. I don't know about you. That would be difficult to be my response. No, it's not well, man of God. <laughs> Did I ask you for this, son? Yet you, you got my hopes up as I told you not to, right? If there's any time to be offended, mad, at God and the man of God, this would rightfully be the time according to our, our natural instincts, right? But what does she say? It is well. And here's what's fascinating. This woman was not living in denial like many modern believers would tell you. It is well. Well, you're just living in denial, right? <laughs> Are you speaking that faith stuff, but you're just living in denial, brother? You just need to look at the facts. She wasn't living in denial, but she simply refused to let her natural reality be her spiritual reality. She refused to let her natural reality become her spiritual reality. It's easy to speak death when we see death, but she chose to speak life even when she saw death. It looks bad. It, it, it's not looking good. My son just died in my arms, but God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to go to the only person I know that can, that can work on your behalf and I'm going to tell them, I'm going to speak faith the whole time I'm going, it is well. Here's what's fascinating. This isn't just some Old Testament story of one woman that did this. This is a New Testament principle that Jesus teaches us to do as well. It's a New Testament principle. Look at Mark 11, verse 23. Jesus said, For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Here's a fascinating thing about this, this, these few verses right here is many times we, we, we might mock people that are speaking in faith, thinking you're living in denial. But Jesus shows us a, a very interesting comparison between speaking and believing. In fact, look at the comparison between speaking and believing. Let's kind of count it out here. He says, first, surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, there says, that's one for says, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes, so now we're one to one, says to believes that those things he says will be done. There's two to one. He will have whatever he says. Three to one. Interesting comparison between the two. Because most people will say, well, you just got to have more faith, brother. Right? Just, or they'll go to the other extreme. Well, you just need to face the reality, face the facts, stop speaking that faith stuff and speaking in denial. But scripture shows us, Jesus shows us and teaches us that there will be times when you have to speak God's word by faith before you ever believe it. You have to speak it by faith before it will ever reach your heart in here to build your faith enough for you to believe it and actually act it out. Here's what speaking does. Speaking keeps the doubt from overtaking you. Speaking keeps fear from crippling you. Speaking keeps death from stealing from you. That's what, that's what speaking does when I'm speaking by faith. What does it do? It keeps doubt from overtaking me, fear from crippling me, death from stealing from me. Because if you've ever been in a crisis situation and you've had to pray and stand on the word of God, you know this. You're faced with all of these doubt thoughts and they're the worst thoughts ever and they're coming in, they're creeping into your mind. But you speak God's word and as a moment when you're speaking God's word, there's a, there's a 30 seconds there where you have peace in your heart. But as soon as you stop speaking, the doubt comes right back right? So what am I doing? I'm in a fight now. And this is where people miss it. I'm in a fight now. What am I saying? What am I allowing to come out of my mouth? Death and, death and life and the power of the tongue. What am I speaking here? Speaking God's word in a time of trouble, it's not living in denial. It's living in spiritual maturity because you're living by faith. I'm walking by faith, not by sight. And it looks bad. It looks awful. My son's dead. I know he's dead. He stopped breathing. But many times we just walk 
And God may be willing life, but we walk into a situation and speak death and experience death. Now, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that every single time that you pray and you you speak God's word, that it's always going to go out how you thought it should go. I'm going to tell you something. There's been plenty of times where Leslie and I have joined our faith together and we've spoken faith and we've seen the miraculous, undeniable, miraculous move of God. But I will also tell you there's been times when I've been full of faith and I've spoke in faith and aligned my words with God's word, yet I didn't see what I was believing I would see. But I can tell you something, no matter what, God's faithful. And no matter what, no matter what, I will choose to believe his word over my life experience every single time. Because I would rather get to heaven and God say, you were a little extreme on that faith stuff, weren't you? <laughs> I'd rather be a little extreme on the faith stuff than rather I get to heaven and God say, I had so much more. I had so much more for you. If you had the faith to believe my word, I would rather be a little extreme. Amen, somebody? I would rather be a little extreme. Speaking by faith, it keeps doubt from overtaking you, fear from crippling you, death from stealing from you. I have two older brothers. I'll give you an example of this. My middle brother, his name's Brad, and uh, when my parents were pregnant, uh, my mom was pregnant with, with Brad, things were progressing well, and at some point in the pregnancy, they had to go, and they got some tests done and blood work done, and, and the tests came back, and it was, uh, they knew something wasn't right. In fact, after several tests, they realized that, that Brad would have some type of neuro, neurological disorder. Basically, they believed, and the diagnosis was, and I don't have all the terminology correct, but the diagnosis was uh, two things. When he's born, this was their facts. When, he was, when he's born, he will either be born stillbirth, he'll be born dead or immediately die, option one. Or when he's born, he'll be so disfigured and his spine will be so, uh, and his nervous system will be so uh, disoriented and even exposed that he will be bound in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. And as my parents begin to get um, those diagnoses, some of the initial responses from the doctor were options to end the pregnancy early. And my parents in faith said, absolutely not. We're not gonna abort this baby because of what you're saying. No matter what, we're gonna trust God and we're gonna love this child. Even if he comes out and he can never communicate and he's stuck in a wheelchair, we will trust God and we will love this child no matter what. At one point throughout the pregnancy, they continued to get these reports and, and they were living in a small town in North Iowa and they had to drive to a, a bigger city to get some tests done from a specialist. And before they went to the specialist, they had the church gather around them, called them up front and they all laid hands on them and prayed over them. And everyone was kind of praying at the same time. One person was kind of leading it. But my mom told me this story yesterday as we were celebrating early Mother's Day for her. And she said, there was a, there was a woman in the church And as they were circled around my parents and laying hands on my mother and praying for healing and praying for God to move, there was a woman in the church who she was, she said, I I had my eyes closed and I I couldn't see where she was, but my mom said, I know which hand was hers. She said, because I could hear her voice distinctly, not louder over the others, but distinctly, I could hear her praying in the spirit, praying in other tongues. And other people were praying in English, some were praying in this, but she said, somehow, she wasn't louder above everyone else, she, but I could hear her. And she said, I know her hand because her hand was hot on my body. Not, not a warm, sweaty hand, it was hot, like a hot pad on my body. After that moment, my parents traveled and they had to do a mini road trip to go down and back. And my parents said that the, after that moment, the presence of God surrounded them so tangibly that they said that as they were driving to the specialist that they, my mom said there were several times she even looked in the back seat because she felt the presence of God so close, like it was somebody physically there with them. They go down, they see the specialist and the specialist, they give a report, but it's, they're, they're still saying it's not good. He will either be stillborn or he will be in a wheelchair the rest of his life and disabled the rest of his life. 
So they continue on in faith. They speak faith. They trust God. They come back home and they just pray in the spirit and spend time with God. And eventually it comes time for my brother Brad to be born. And because of the situation, the delivery room is full of people. Not just my mom's doctor, but the pediatrician and nurses. Why? Because this is a crisis situation no matter which option comes out. Whether he's dead or disabled, he will need immediate care. The room is full. <laughs> and when my mom gave birth to my brother Brad, my dad said there was a audible gasp in the room. <gasps> and at first it's like, man, how bad is it? What, what is it? You know, what's going on? Not long after that, a few seconds, and they heard the crying of a fat, healthy, perfect baby boy. Praise God, you can give him a round of applause. No disfigurements, no illness, no lingering effects, no sign of anything. No sign of anything. My dad said the only thing he had was one, one mole on his thigh right here. And if you want to call that, that some type of defect or something, we'll take that any day. No signs. Perfectly healthy. He went on to set several records in many different sports in his athletic career. And now he's a highway patrolman that serves Rogers County. He's gone above and beyond. He's, he helps people every single day. And, and he saves lives and he helps and he serves people. But here's what I want to show you something. A mother's faith speaks faith. They could have chosen early on to say, let's just, well, the doctor said we should just abort this baby and try again in the future. They could have chosen death, but they didn't. But the other thing is this, the lady that prayed for my mom and her hand became warm and she was praying in the spirit. A mother's faith speaks faith. That lady herself had a son who was wheelchair bound and disabled but she didn't let what she saw in her life affect her faith to believe that God could still heal and God could still move. So yeah, I commend my parents' faith because I can't imagine. However, the faith of that mother to say, I've experienced this, but I'm still gonna believe this book for your life anyway. And guess what? God moved and God brought healing and there's no explanation besides <laughs> an audible gasp in the room at a miracle of the living God. Amen, somebody? It's easy to speak death, but as we mature in the faith, we should align our words with the words of Jesus and say, Lord, it's tough to believe. Help my unbelief, but I'm gonna choose to still speak even when I don't see it. I'm gonna choose to still speak even if I don't, I don't believe it in here, but if it's enough to give me a mustard seed faith growing in my heart, I know that's enough for you to move. And so Lord, help me in my unbelief. Learn to believe as I speak God's word. A mother's faith speaks in faith. And point number three is this. A mother's faith is persistent. A mother's faith is persistent. A mother's faith is persistent. It's unwavering. It's tenacious. It can hang on to something like a, like a bulldog can and, and not let it go. It can, it can hang on to it until something changes. That's that mama bear mode, right? Don't mess with my kids, don't mess with my family. I, I will fight you if I have to, right? It's unwavering, it's tenacious. And the Shunammite woman, she finally gets to Elisha now. She's got past the servant. It is well with her husband, it is well with the servant. She finally makes it to Elisha. And I don't have this on the screen for you, but verse 28 says this, she said, did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? And then in verse 29, I got this for you here. It says, then he said, Elisha said to Gehazi, get yourself ready, take my staff in your hand and be on your way. Lay my staff on the face of the child, verse 30. And the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So Elisha arose and he followed her. What'd she say here? She made a statement in persistent and determined faith. She said, I'm not going home until you go with me. As sure as God lives and as sure as you're living right in front of me, as your soul lives and I see you breathing and your body is alive, I'm not going anywhere. Come with me home. Come with me. I will not waver. 
I will not be moved until I receive the answer which I am praying for. Let's continue on in verse 31. Now Gehazi went ahead of them, and he laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Therefore he went back to meet him, the man of God, and he told him, saying, The child has not awakened. And when Elisha came into the house, there was the child lying dead on his bed. And he went in, therefore, he shut the, the door behind the two of them, and he prayed to the Lord. And at this moment, you can read some of the, the in-between verses here, but he goes back and forth, and he's, he's continuing to minister and, 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 and pray and, and go before the Lord and, and, and bring this situation. And finally, in verse 35, it says this. He goes back into the room. He returned, verse 35, and he walked back and forth in the house, and again he went up, and he stretched himself out on him, the child. Then the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi, Gehazi and he said, Call the Shunammite woman. So he called her. And when she came into him, he said, Pick up your son. So she went in, look at this, fell at his feet, bowed to the ground. Then she picked up her son and she went out. Once again, I don't know about you, but if the last time I saw my son, he was dead on that bed, and I walk into a room and my son is breathing and alive. I'm going to run to my son, pick him up and hold him. And then I will turn to the man of God and say, thank you. Not this mother, <laughs> not this Shunammite woman. She fell at his feet. Then she picked up her son. A grateful heart in humility is an open door for God to work in our lives. But too many times we're so concerned about what I want and my desires and what I'm praying for and dreaming for that we blow past what God did just to get to our answer without saying, thank you, thank you. And what does that say about her faith? She knew her son wasn't gonna die again, that he wasn't still on his deathbed. Otherwise she'd go over there and, and, and serve him and, and minister to him. What does she do? She stops, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Then she goes and she picks up her son. The Lord raised the boy back to life because of the mother's persistent faith. Think about this. The persistent faith of this woman, of this mother, is why her boy was brought back to life. She could have buried her son and waited for the man of God to come back around and then say, guess where my son is? He's out there in the field. We buried him. And then let the man of God have it. She could have. Most people would. He's dead. Let's have a funeral. Why go bother the man of God? She could have given up right there. She could have spoken death on her traveling and on the way to see the man of God. Well, he's dead. And by the time she got to the servant and the man of God, she could have already been speaking death, but she didn't. She could have settled for the man of God's servant taking a staff back to the house and laying it on the child. But as we see in scripture, that did not raise the child. So I'm glad her faith wasn't in the staff because her child would still be dead. But her persistent faith to say, I ain't going anywhere until you come and raise this child back. She was persistent in her faith and she received all that God promised her. And whether you're a mother in this room or hoping to be, praying to be a mother someday, or whether you're, you are uh, someone else in between and you are believing God for something, here's my prayer, Hebrews 10, verse 35. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then, look at this, then you will receive all that he's promised. Friend, the message today is simple. Don't throw away your confident trust in the Lord. Don't throw away your faith in the Lord. The persistence of your faith will pay off. Amen, somebody? It will pay off. Don't stop now. Don't give up. Keep trusting God, and in due time, you will experience the goodness of the Lord. It says patient endurance is what you need. Don't throw away your faith. Patient endurance is what you need. So you continue to do God's will. Then you will receive. Everybody say, I will. Say like you mean, I will. I will receive that which he's promised me. Look at this, Psalm 27. I remain confident of this. Why, why remain? Because that means time has passed. 
I don't have to remain if time isn't passing. I remain, I stay steadfast, I am planted here. I am remaining confident of this, that I will, somebody say, I will. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I remain confident. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. For all the moms in here, I don't know what season you find yourself in. Maybe you're in a tough season and maybe you got little ones at home and and they're, you know, two years old and it, it, it feels like a struggle, two, three years old, and it feels like a struggle every day. It's a fight and you're exhausted. Remain confident in this. You will see the goodness of the Lord. Maybe you find yourself in here and you have a child who is far from God. They're not walking with God like they should be. They're they're a prodigal son, a prodigal daughter, and they're far from God. Remain confident of this. You will see the goodness of the Lord. Maybe you've lost a child, whether through a miscarriage or, or maybe they passed away prematurely early before you, and you have heartbreak in your heart, and every Mother's Day it resurfaces, and it's there, and it's, and it's a difficult thing to keep contained. Remain confident in this, that you will see the goodness of the Lord. Maybe you're battling with infertility today, and you don't know why it's been such a struggle to, to get pregnant or to get pregnant again. Remain confident in this. You will see the goodness of the Lord. That's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for you. We can learn a lot from a mother's faith, that it's active, that it speaks in faith, and that it is persistent. But one of the things I know is this, is that moms need prayer. (laughs) Motherhood is not easy. It asks a lot of you. And so today I would like to finish as we wrap up, and I would love to pray for all the moms in the room. In fact, I'm going to ask you to stand here in just a second as as we pray. Mother's Day, it's a celebration. It's a day that we honor moms, but I I also acknowledge the fact that there is some sadness that can be attached to it as well for some people. If you have babies that are in heaven that you've never held and you've never met, if you, some ladies in here that you want to be a mom, but you haven't been able to yet, I wanna pray for you. So I wanna take a moment and pray for all the moms, no matter your situation. And so if you're currently a mother, if you would just stand to your feet, if you're currently a mom, if you're praying and you're believing to be a mom someday and you haven't been able to yet, but you would like to stand by faith and have us pray for you, I would love to pray with you. You can feel free to stand as well. Even if maybe you're like, I don't, I'm not even married, but I'm believing for a spouse. Maybe you're believing to be, a, be married and have kids in the future. If you would like to stand, you're more than welcome to stand. I would love to pray for you. If you've lost a baby, or maybe you've lost a child who has passed away early, I would love to pray for you. If you have a child who is not living for the Lord, I would love to pray for you. In fact, here's what we're gonna do. For all of the the family members, if your mom or or your family member is nearby, if you would just reach out and grab their hand or put your hand on their shoulder. If you're not related to the person around you, you know, just, you can pray in agreement, but don't, you know, don't feel pressure to lay your hands on somebody you don't know. I want to pray for you. I believe that today God is going to work in your life. He's going to fill you with hope and with healing. And today, it will be a good day. And this next year will be a good year for you. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, today, Lord, as we honor the mothers in this room and the mothers that are listening to this or watching online right now, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would bring peace, that you would bring joy to the moms today, that today would not be a burden, today would not be a stressful time, today would be a joyful time filled with peace. I pray, Lord, that you would supernaturally give them energy in their spirit today. For those moms that are staying at home, those moms that are serving their little ones, I pray that you give them peace, give them energy, Lord. Give them rest today. Heavenly Father, I pray specifically for those moms who have lost babies or lost their children early. Lord, would you heal the hearts of those moms? And Lord, would you, would you hug those babies extra tight in heaven until we get there? Heal the hearts of those moms today. 
Lord, would you encourage the moms whose kids are far from you? Would you give them encouragement today? Would you bring them hope today? And Lord, would you, by your power and your presence, would you bring those prodigals home? In Jesus' name. Lord, I pray right now for the women who want to be moms, but for some reason or some medical reason, it's keeping them. Lord, I ask you right now to heal their bodies in the name of Jesus. Lord, would you heal their wombs in the name of Jesus? Would you go to work right now? Bring wisdom, Lord, if there's things that need to change or shift or or things that they can do. Lord, would you bring breakthrough today? And Lord, we just declare here at Abide Church that we are going to have a baby boom in this place, Lord. No more infertility, no more issues, Lord, but those women would have their heart's desire as they walk in agreement with your word to be fruitful, to multiply. And we acknowledge that our kids are a blessing, Lord. They're arrows for us. So Lord, I believe for healing in Jesus' name, in bodies and in wombs for these mothers and future mothers. Lord, I pray for the women who haven't found a godly man to marry yet but, and, and to start a family with just yet. But I ask you, Lord, to bring the right man at the right time, a godly man, a God-fearing man who will lead with the leadership of Jesus as a servant, even unto death. Would you bring a, a godly man, the right man at the right time in Jesus' name? And Lord, today, we lift them up. We acknowledge that you are the healer. You are the one who brings hope and freedom. And I ask you, Lord, today, would you bless my sisters in Christ? Would you make this a good day for them, a healing day, a joyful day, an honoring day for them in the position that they hold? Lord, we thank you for it. In Jesus' holy name, everyone said, amen, amen.